The topic of today's class is reducing risks from natural hazards. Notice I said natural hazards, not natural disasters. Natural hazards are events in nature like hurricanes, earthquakes, and tsunamis. We know they can be dangerous, but not all are. There are many small tsunamis and earthquakes we don't even, even notice, and hurricanes that just die out. By the same token, we know they can create terrible disasters in which many people die and widespread damage is sustained. Three prime examples of this are the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005, Hurricane Katrina in the U.S. in the same year, and the tsunami in the Indian Ocean in 2004. Now, all of you remember those, don't you? Well, today we'll examine ways to reduce our risks from natural hazards so they don't become natural disasters. Now, we can't stop earthquakes or hurricanes or tsunamis, but there are things we can do to try to minimize or limit their impact. So, I'm going to divide this lecture into two parts. First, we'll look at some of the factors that go into designing an emergency plan. You may be familiar with some of this based on what's in place in your own communities. Then I want us to turn to the role of education in reducing risks to people in disaster-prone regions. But first, let's go over the terms we'll be using. The first is disaster preparedness. To prepare means to get ready, right? Preparedness is the state of being ready. Another term is mitigation. To mitigate means to make less severe, not as bad. We use the phrase disaster preparedness and mitigation to talk about what to do to prepare for natural disaster so that the impact will be less severe and people will suffer less. We can try to lessen or mitigate the damage so that people can quickly return to their normal lives. Now I'll present some factors involved in generating an emergency response plan. First, Government officials need to identify the risks. What are the natural hazards? For example, in Japan, there are earthquakes and typhoons. In the U.S., hurricanes and fires. There are several natural hazards in every country. Second, the government needs to establish a channel of communications with scientists. Scientists must be able to share information regularly with the government as they collect data about risks. Third, government officials need to work out a process for briefing the public on what scientists tell them. The problem is experts can't predict natural hazards with 100% accuracy. For example, they may know a hurricane is forming but can't say exactly when or where it will go. Despite this, public officials still have to decide what to tell the public and when. They can wait and say nothing or they can tell people to evacuate. If they wait too long, lots of people might get hurt. But if they tell people to evacuate and then nothing happens, people may get angry. In the future, they may not cooperate. Communicating with the public is a huge challenge for officials. Here's an example. In 2005, before Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, people were told to evacuate. But 61% of them didn't. We know some stayed because they had no transportation, no choice. But of the 61% who didn't leave, 37% said they simply ignored the order to evacuate. Why? Because they didn't want to leave their homes. Scientific information doesn't do much good if it's ignored. Yet ultimately, officials must try to keep people safe. A fourth factor is evaluating what services are needed. For example, are there sufficient numbers of police, firefighters, and emergency workers who are trained to respond to a natural disaster? Is there a network in place for emergency workers to distribute supplies, such as bottled water, food, blankets, and medicine? Is there a way to inform the public about the emergency plan so that they know where to go and what to do before, during, and after a natural disaster? Well, related to this evaluation is the fifth and final factor, 
setting spending priorities. Countries have to decide whether to spend money for things they need now, like new schools and roads, or to allocate money to prepare for a natural, natural disaster that may never happen. Now let's turn to the role of education in emergency planning. Experts agree that educating the public, especially children, about the risks is essential. Here's one way. The United Nations group UNESCO has launched an international campaign called Disaster Risk Reduction Begins at School. In turn, many schools in countries like Turkey, France, Mexico, and Cuba now have disaster preparedness and safety programs. The logic behind this UNESCO program is education will help children understand the risks where they live. They'll know specific things to do before, during, and after a natural disaster to make everyone in their communities safer. The hope is that as more children are educated, there will be fewer victims of natural disasters. For example, in Turkey, earthquakes threaten the safety of about 5 million children. So there is now an earthquake education program targeted at students countrywide. And in Cuba recently, with more school programs about hurricanes, there have been fewer hurricane victims. Now that's great news. So let's review what we've covered today. I mentioned five factors in an emergency plan and how education of children is considered vital to disaster preparedness and mitigation. I feel a lot of hope now because so many countries see how important a good emergency plan is. Well, that's all for today. We'll see you next time.